Gavin Gear here for makingwithmetal.com and ultimatereloader.com. I just completed this awesome rifle build. I did the rebarrel on this Winchester Model 70 heavy varmint in 22-250. Turned out awesome and we're midway through the series where I'm chronicling this whole journey. In the first video, which you're going to want to check out, I talked about my process of getting geared up, meeting the right people, doing all the research, and getting mentally prepared for this kind of a critical job. In this video, I'm going to talk about the process start to finish. Now, I will note that by watching this video, you accept the terms of the disclaimer that's in the video description. So, make sure you read that before proceeding. In the next video, we're going to cover all the tools, machinery, equipment, supplies, parts, all of that, so that you can know what exactly you would need to acquire, what you would need to make in order to do this kind of work. Okay, so. In terms of this rebarreling job, I want to break this down into three phases. And this will be really quick and really high level. You're going to want to read the accompanying blog post for more details. We're going to have a lot more stories like this to cover a lot of these details from different angles. So, we start on the bench with the disassembly, measurement, and a little bit of math to figure out what we're going to need to do in terms of cutting and in terms of checking with head spaces, that sort of thing. Then we go over to the lathe, we do the tenon, cutting and threading, we do the chambering, I flipped the barrel around and threaded the muzzle, so I'll cover that real quickly. And then we're back to the bench where we put it all together again and get ready to fire our first shots. So, in terms of taking the rifle apart, I started by removing the barreled action from the stock and then took the trigger off of the action. Because I knew I was going to be spinning the action on and off the barrel after I did my threading work on the lathe and was checking headspace, that kind of thing. And then it was time to actually remove the barrel from the action. And this was an inch and an eighth diameter, this factory Winchester barrel setup. And I didn't have the right bushing for the Brownells vise. So what I did was I took some high quality 3M duct tape, and you can use kind of any sort of tape for this, and wrapped it a couple times so that it would build up the diameter and an oversized set of bushings would do the job. Now, the first time I took the barrel off the action, I had to wrap on the end of the action wrench with a hammer because it was on really, really tight. But I took it on and off a few times and did some photography and whatnot. So the final removal was really easy, of course. But just note that you might need some rosin on your bushings and you might need to use a little bit of heat. There's you know, Sometimes actions are just really difficult and barrels are really firmly uh, kind of attached. Okay, so I got the barrel off and then it was time to take a look with the Lyman Borcam borescope and I confirmed, as I showed in the last video, that this barrel was toasted. The throat was completely heat cracked. I actually had heat cracks pretty much the entire length of the barrel. So that was good because I knew then that my shoe and match barrel was going to bring things up to spec. So then I took a series of measurements, and this is super, super critical. You want to take your time and get this all right. You want to refer to your reference charts for the action that you're working with to make sure that all your dimensions fall in the right bounds. But it never hurts to measure everything because you never know what kind of gunsmithing might have been done before. So I measured to see what my bolt nose to tenon clearance needed to be what kind of measurements I was going to need to take from that finished tenon with the headspace gauge and a depth micrometer to make sure that I was in the right vicinity for chambering right there at the end when you need to start threading the action on and using feeler gauges and getting to that last ten thousandths, five thousandths, one thousandth, that kind of thing. So uh, in the full blog post, you're going to want to read that. I have a little bit more detail about all of these measurements and the calculations. So double check that with Bill Maher from Rifle Shooter. And at this point, it was time to go over to the lathe and get the barrel dialed in. Let's go over there real quick. So the lathe I'm using is the Precision Matthews PM1440GT, built and outboard Spider 4 and some extra storage. This is a really high quality Taiwanese lathe that's ideally suited for gunsmithing, especially considering it has a short spindle, 15 inches, with two inch through spindle capacity. Amazing. But before it was ready to work on the actual shill and match barrel, I felt like I needed to go through a dress rehearsal. So I took the two inch cutoff section to bring it down to 26 inches overall, and I went through the entire tenon threading process, all of the cutting, the chambering process on that two inch cut down section, and it was an invaluable exercise. So if you're gonna start chambering rifle barrels, 
I recommend you take an old takeoff barrel or section of barrel and experiment a bit. I've been threading on a lathe since the 80s, so this was nothing new, but this is mission critical work here. Everything's got to be absolutely perfect. So having completed that exercise, I went on to working on the shill and match barrel itself. And the first part of that process was dialing in the barrel. And I used the Gordy Gritters method, which involves using a grizzly bar with bushings. And these bushings are available from Pacific Tool and Gauge. And they, if you get a set, they run in two tenth increments. So you can, you can find a, a diameter that's gonna run freely in the bore, but without any looseness. That's what you want. And as Gordy mentions, what you really care about, you can't assume that the bore is perfectly concentric with the outside of the barrel. And specifically, each end might have a little bit of bow to it. So what you really care about is the last inches of the bore, regardless of whether you're working on the breech end or on the muzzle end. So I worked with the Grizzly bar at different distances in the barrel until I was confident. I did a two-stage method on this. I used a thousandth indicator on a regular Noga indicator holder to take it dialed to where I was like plus or minus a half of a thousandth or so. And again, running it in and out. And then I went to the tenth indicator on another Noga base, which has uh, the multi-jointed feature and the nod. Because when you're working with a tenth indicator, the range of movement is really, really small and it's incredibly sensitive in terms of getting it to read zero midway through the swing of what you're dialing in. That took a long time, and again, I'm, I'm working on my chops here. I'm figuring this out, but once I got the barrel completely dialed in at the breech end, it was time to get going. And I started by facing the breech end because you want that nice, clean datum point. I then turned the tenon down, and I was doing an inch by 16 thread, so I turned it to 995, just a little bit under, which is good for, for threading and I cut it 20 thousandths long. I gave myself a little bit of a relief, just like the factory barrel here, uh, between the shoulder and where the thread starts, and I chamfered the ends so that the start of the threads would be nice and clean. I then proceeded to thread the tenon, and the tenon threading you know, is pretty straightforward if you're used to threading, but there's some things that are really critical, and the main thing is the finish and then also the fit. If anything, I wanted resistance while the action would spin on and off, you know, but uh, didn't want it to be loose. So what I did is I took some digital calipers and I measured the troughs of the threads on the takeoff barrel, which threads into the same receiver with the threads that I was cutting on the lathe. And I used, because it's 16 threads per inch, on the threading dial I could use any even number, any odd number, and any dash in between. So I, I cut them that way, but then when you get towards that last you know, few thousandths of an inch, I used the same dash so that it would be the same position on the lead screw each time, which gives you the best possible accuracy in your threading. So I worked my way up. At first, the action would spin on one thread, then two threads, then I could get it all the way really, really tight, and then I gave it just that like half of a thousandth of an inch, and I could see the chip curling off, and you know that just told me this is a good rigid setup, this is good precision, and then I got just the right fit with the threads between the tenon and the action. So that I was really, really happy with, and then I cleaned up the shoulder and made sure that I didn't have a radius between the shoulder and, and the tenon really, really important because you want to make sure that receiver goes completely square up against the shoulder on the barrel. So then it was time to cut the tenon to length. And this is the critical dimension. This is the dimension you're going to be measuring your headspace against. And it's the dimension that's going to define your bolt nose to tenon clearance, which is a critical factor. So I measured five times. I cut that down and then it was ready for chambering and I took my time. I ran a really slow, slow spindle speed. I was running, plunging about 40 thousandths of an inch, pulling the reamer out, pulling the chips off, relubing it with my Viper's Venom, and squirting, squirting some Viper's Venom in the bore, and then continuing, continuing, continuing. And doing this is a, it's, it's a slow process, but if you take your time and you make sure 
that you're not rolling chips. I used Bill Maher's method for that of starting the lathe with the reamer up against the, the chamber that you're cutting and then stopping it with the reamer spinning in place and then pulling it out to make sure that I didn't roll any chips. It all went really, really good. And then you get to that point where you can see, hey, I need to start taking depth measurements. So then you take your headspace gauge, you put it in the chamber that you're cutting and you measure the base of it to the shoulder of the tenon and the barrel. And this is where you work your way up to that number that you've calculated on paper and you're gonna get to within five or 10 thousandths or so. And at that point, you can start spinning the action on and then using a feeler gauge with the headspace gauge you know, in place, and then that'll tell you how much further you need to go with the depth of your chamber before you're gonna be just right. And this is kind of a critical factor because you need to know exactly how tight you want your chamber to be. You want it to close on a go gauge, and you want it to not close on a no-go gauge. So there's quite a bit of <laughs> precise measurement going on there and spinning the action on several times, but I finally got it to the point where I was confident of where I wanted to be. Noting that when you tighten the barrel onto the action, it's gonna crush everything down and reduce that dimension slightly. My goal was to have the bolt handle come down with a very slight amount of resistance on the go gauge at the very bottom of the throw so that I had a tight chamber but within tolerance. And I got that exactly. So I was super, super happy with that. I cut a chamfer at the entrance of the chamber for good feeding, and then I polished the inside of the chamber with 320 grit. You wanna make sure you don't over polish because the, the ridges and the scratches that you get from polishing with a rougher sandpaper like 320 are gonna actually give you good grip in terms of when that brass is expanding. It's not gonna try and elongate or work its way out under the intense pressure that it's under. I dressed up the threads a little bit with the thread file and then kind of finished polishing everything, then it was time to take the barrel out, spin it around, and thread the muzzle. And I'm gonna cover this in a bit more detail, but it was basically the same process as cutting the tendon. I got everything dialed completely in, and I decided on 5 8 by 24, because I'm gonna kind of use that as a standard muzzle threading for suppressors and muzzle brakes, all of that. And that went really well. I used the Ruger Precision Rifle as a pattern, and I did a recessed crown, the crown came out awesome. It's razor sharp. You can really see the lands and the grooves when you look at the crown from, from the end of the, of the muzzle. And I used the Ruger Precision Rifle thread protector as kind of a rough thread gauge and took some measurements and was really happy with how that turned out. Okay, then it was time to go back to the bench and put everything together. Let's take a look at that again. So the assembly went really smooth. It was more or less the inverse of taking the rifle apart. I had inch and a quarter bushings for the Brownells barrel vise, and the barrel blank was inch and a quarter. I had opened up the stock on the milling machine using a custom cutter that I had made from a wood cutting spade bit, and, and that worked really well. And I, I basically gave this diameter here on the bit the kind of tolerance that I wanted up here at the fattest part of, of the barrel. So I spun the action onto the barrel. I put it in the barrel bus. I used a little bit of masking tape, two inch masking tape on the bushings uh, because I had blued the barrel with some cold blue and wanted to protect the, the new finish. And that worked awesome. I clamped it down. I tightened the barrel onto the action. I checked my headspace. I had removed the ejector I left the extractor on because I knew I could hook the headspace gauge in and that wouldn't really interfere with things. But I wanted to have the feel of the headspace measurement without the extractor pushing on everything. Then I upgraded my scope mounts because I wanted to use a standard set of scope rings. And I put a scope on and of course shooting the rifle confirmed Yes, this is absolutely a shooter and this is gonna be a keeper. And I'm gonna go through a 10 shot load development and I'm gonna do an optimal charge weight exercise to determine exactly where I need to be with my load. So this should be an awesome varmeter rifle. Really happy with the tools. Everything went 
really smoothly. And I think it was because I just absolutely took my time. I went super, super, super slow. And again, I'll have more details in the write-up, which you're going to want to read. And make sure you check out the next video, which is going to be all the tools, equipment, and the supplies in a bit more detail. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up. Make sure you're subscribed to Gavin Tube because I've got a lot more gunsmithing and shooting and reloading and metalworking coming up that you're going to want to check out. Until next time, happy metalworking, happy shooting, and happy reloading. Mm -hmm.